Tori for Nanoscale Optics. Uh, the focus of the project was on manipulating the charge state of nitrogen defects in diamond. So the entire goal of everything we do involves trying to take a simple quantum system, like a two-level system consisting of something like electron spins, and manipulate the variables within it. So if we, for example, wanted to change the spin of an electron, then we could encode information in whether the spin is up or down. So a down spin could be a zero and an up spin could be a one. So the kind of manipulation that we're trying to achieve involves being able to very precisely change single quantum variables, like the spin of an electron, in order to store and eventually compute information within a quantum system. The problem with doing something like this is that these systems are extremely delicate. These electrons can easily couple to things outside of the immediate system, meaning that we can easily have this wave function or this qubit decohere, causing the loss of information that we're trying to store. The entire thing that we're trying to do is stabilize the two-level system that we're using for computation. So the way that we do that involves making our qubits inside diamond. The reason diamond is an excellent substrate for quantum computing is because it's an extremely stable network. So it's able to easily shield from external influences, meaning that if we build a qubit deep within the diamond, it's not going to couple easily to things beyond the lattice. The way that we make the actual two-level system that we want to be able to perform operations on involves bombarding the lattice with ions of some sort. And what that does is that knocks single carbons at points in the lattice out of, out of their bonding to the remainder of the lattice. So we end up with four dangling bonds and a missing carbon. We then heat up the diamond, we anneal it, and these holes, or these gaps rather, in the lattice naturally will gravitate towards nitrogen impurities in the diamond because the lone pair on the nitrogen is looking for space so it's, a, it's entropically favorable for the two to couple. So when we, end, we end up after annealing in a situation in which we have a vacancy immediately next to a nitrogen atom which is the nitrogen vacancy defect in diamond consisting of two points in the former uh, diamond lattice. So the system has six electrons, it has three from unpaired sp3 orbitals from carbons and has two from the lone pair of the nitrogen uh, because of the level structure, it has many favorable properties like paramagnetism that we can exploit for a system. The only problem is that despite its relative stability in the lattice, we still end up with an occasional effect where it'll lose one of the electrons in the system due to something as random as a thermal agitation or just a, a scattering hole in the lattice or other positive influences. So the entire goal of what we're doing involves trying to deter this process from happening, trying to forestall the ionization of the NV minus center uh, to this five electron state, which we can't do computation with. So the way that we're trying to deter this from happening involves just covering this area around the NV minus center, the six electron center, with as many electrons as possible. Because this both will prevent any positive charges from taking an electron from our center, because there's so many other negative charges they could take instead, it's just less likely to happen. And it also exerts a coulombic pressure on the center, because the electrostatic forces kind of prevent and confine the uh, six electrons within the NV center and discourage them from jumping out of the NV minus state. The structures that we're using to do this, the first one is diamond nanowires. We just take a piece of diamond, we write circles on the top using uh, E-beam lithography, and then we etch wires into it and we end up with these nice pillars. The reason that this works is because, one, the, uh, the extra surface area to volume ratio means that we can really manipulate the NV centers within the pillars easily, and it's also because the uh, pillar itself acts as a natural antenna, so it will amplify any signals we're reading off of the antenna. So what we then do to these pillars, now that we have this high surface area to volume ratio, is we coat them with some sort of uh, crystal uh, structure on the very top la layer. And by doing that, we induce lattice mismatches, because whatever crystal we put on, like uh, silicon dioxide is a common we one we try, is not going to want to bond with the diamond. It's not going to have the same crystal structure. So at the interface between the diamond and the silicon dioxide, we end up with strange things like dangling bonds that induce interface charges. These charges then induce local electric fields right beneath the surface, right beneath this interface, that then can draw electrons up to the surface and end up with local areas that have extra electrons, which is the condition we need to stabilize the NV minus centers. And so you can see from this numerical finite element simulation that within the pillar we have a local excess of negative charge, which is the condition that we're looking for. So we tried fabricating these. 
uh, using e-beam lithography. These are two coatings that we've done so far. Uh, so far it seems to be working. We, uh, the biggest issue that we need to work on is making sure that we get a very uniform layer so we're getting very similar readings from whichever nanowire we happen to be measuring. The idea is that we'd have enough NV centers in nanowires in one of these larger rays that we could get a strong signal to noise ratio. Uh, so that requires getting both a lot of pillars and getting a uniform coating on top of those pillars. The other method that we use in addition to nanowires and nanopillars with a passive coating involves actually, put, actually making an active manipulation layer on top of the diamond. The way that we do that involves putting down a thin layer of conductor on top of the diamond, putting some sort of voltage probe on top of that, and then just tuning the voltage of that plate to create an electric field under the surface. The advantage of this is that it's very, very customizable. We can try taking electrons away by having a negative voltage at the gate, or we can have a high positive voltage and bring a lot of electrons towards the gate. In the diagram, the metal or the uh, silver part would be the actual gate where we're putting the voltage. And the two gold parts that just serve as ground so that we can replenish charges that we're moving around. Uh, and there's another finite element simulation that kind of shows where we expect the local maxima of the distribution to, of charge to be. So we developed a, uh, layer, a, a layer structure that allows us to build these devices directly onto diamond. We take the diamond substrate and we cover it with a layer of oxide in order to protect the surface from having sh reactions with air and other things we can't control. We then open up windows in that oxide layer, and in those windows we deposit our contacts. Uh, and so the, the XY picture just shows what these structures look like from above if I'm looking down on them. We have two designs that we're testing. Uh, one kind of has uh, more gap spacing so we can really get a better idea of like what kind of distance these uh, ionization patterns occur at. And so we've been working on developing the process for building these structures. And so we, uh, and so this picture is just the, uh, the pattern that we tried to write. And then the other picture is the pr result of a photolithography process in which we tried to lift off gold and leave the patterns. Uh, this is kind of the most sensitive step in our process because gold lift off is notoriously kind of tricky to get the right uh, spacing. But you can see in the picture that we had these very fine lines in the bottom rectangles. Uh, those are about three micron gaps, meaning that we can at least get that minimum resolution. Uh, this is good because if, if we can't write these very fine distances, then we're going to end up with strange like short circuits between contacts or even like fringing fields. Uh, so this kind of shows that we've so far developed something that uh, works for this process. So the next step would be to actually take these devices that we've been making and put them inside a confocal micros microscopy setup. Uh, what we can do is we can excite the NV minus center with a laser that's tuned to the specific resonant frequency of the transition uh, of spin or uh, optical transitions within the center. We can then just, uh, we can then turn on a detector, a aval an avalanche photodiode, and wait for these NV minus centers to re-emit these electrons, and then we can get counts of how many NV minus centers there are. So what we would do is we would get a lot of these devices that both have, uh, that are inducing charges at the surface and that aren't, and we look for a statistical shift in the number of NV minus versus NV zero counts that we get, and using that we'd be able to draw conclusions uh, as to the number of NV centers that we've successfully altered. Uh, so just some quick acknowledgements, uh, my mentor Khadija and uh, Professor Lanchar, as well as the remainder of the Lanchar group who have given me invaluable advice throughout this entire project. Uh, are there any questions? So, so the question was, if we do succeed in manipulating, say, the spin or another two-level variable, what, how do we proceed from there? Um, so that's, that's something that there's a lot of uh, theoretical work and a lot of work in uh, quantum DOS that's already kind of dealt with this. The issue is that once, once you have the spin RIN, uh, you need to be able to make sure that you can consistently, consistently and reliably uh, check the spin to make sure it hasn't been corrupted by some external problems, so you, there's all these like quantum error correction schemes that have been tried out. That's probably not something that we specifically would do, because we focus more on the device itself, but there's a lot of theory out there for how to proceed to larger scale quantum systems.
So, well, once we align the uh, nanowire array on our diamond, we actually, uh, it actually only takes about 40 minutes to write a bunch of arrays. It's actually like relatively fast. 